Hello, everybody. I'm Kirk Dominic, President and CEO of the World Federation of Youth Clubs, and I'd like to welcome you to our inaugural episode of the WFYC podcast series, Youth Development Beyond Borders. In future episodes, you'll have an opportunity to meet WFYC partners, youth development experts from around the world, and we'll even share some success stories from our affiliates and the young people they serve. We thought it would be most appropriate in this inaugural episode for you to meet and hear from co-founders of WFYC, Rick Goings and Susan Picaro Goings. Welcome, Rick and Susan. Thank Good you. To be Thank here. you for being Great here. Great to be here. So Rick and Susan are often described as global humanitarians and philanthropists, titles that they certainly live up to. I'm going to make it more simple. I refer to Rick and Susan as the ultimate power couple. Rick has a long history of success in the corporate world, most notably as the chairman and CEO of Tupperware Brands for nearly 30 years. I first met Rick and Susan during Rick's 30 years of service on the Board of Governors of Boys and Girls Clubs of America, where he twice served as chairman. And Rick, again, not only the co-founder of WFYC, but served as our founding chairman until earlier this year. Susan Picaro, going, let me tell you, is a force of her own. She has started her career as a television news broadcaster, which makes her much better at this than me. <laughs> but she's now known globally as an advocate for women's empowerment, a staunch supporter of at-risk youth, again, the co-founder of WFYC, and our current chairman of the board. So welcome again to you both. We're so, so grateful for you to be here. Thank you very much. And we are thrilled to have you as our CEO and president of the World Federation of Youth Clubs. And you handle all of the day-to-day -day and uh, deal directly with all of the countries that we handle. We greatly appreciate everything that you do, and we're thrilled to be here today. Well, you're what, what I really like about this, too, is that you really were a youth of the year and almost <laughs> became the national youth uh, of the year. I think it was your southern accent, maybe, mm -hmm. helped you back some, but <laughs> I have known you my whole time with Boys and Girls Club. In the, with the movement, and you're a wonderful example of the product of what happens at a Boys and Girls Club. So this is this is really a, a group of mutual support and admiration. Well, thank you. I tell people I first found the youth club, boys club for me when I was 12 years old. The only thing I was good at was making bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and they, did, they did what boys and girls clubs and youth clubs do. They worked their magic, and here I am. Here. We want to talk a little bit about the impetus for the World Federation of Youth Clubs. And as I shared before, you both were so involved, have been so involved with Boys and Girls Clubs in the United States and very well known for that. And, and many people would say, wow, you, you have your hands full there with all the work that you've done over the th last three decades. But so what was the motivation for taking the Boys and Girls Club model or youth club model beyond the borders of the United States? Susan, I know there's kind of a cool story there. Well, there is, but it really started out with you as twice being chairman of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and youth organizations outside the United States would, would hear about the Boys and Girls Clubs of America and their great success, and they would reach out to them and, and for advice, and um, and you were aware of this, and Glenn Permoy, who is um, one of our partners in this, in this uh, wonderful organization that has been created, um, was really got you involved with the global clubs and they would even attend a boys and girls club national conference, even though they weren't a United States or on a U.S. military base, they were not really truly affiliated, but they were kind enough to have them come in and they could participate and learn about the programs. And then that led to. The founding of the organization, uh, you know, early on, I think like, some people have asked, well, why don't you just have boys and girls clubs spread across the world and why didn't they do it? Well, actually, uh, the desire was there to give any kind of help we could, but by uh, our you know, federal charter, we weren't able to do that. And so when a phone call would come in, some organizations out there, or sometimes individuals that wanted to replicate what was going on in the US, they uh, we try to provide technical assistance, and that's why Glenn Pormoy was, boy, he was the cavalry, and he would go and do it. And, uh, but, uh, you know, that's why this has made so much sense. Somebody said to me uh, some months ago, uh, if this didn't exist, 
somebody had to start it. And that's pretty much what Susan said. Yeah. Well, we saw the great need and we saw that more and more countries were coming forward. And so I, I said, direct, let's just start our own. We had no idea how to do that. He had a better idea than I did. I mean, but the desire was there. And, and we, we, uh, we would see the, the dire need that children around the world had for a youth organization like the Boys and Girls Club. Obviously, it had to be quite different because you have so many different countries, different cultures, different languages, all many, many differences, sure. but also at the same time, very much alike. I mean, kids are kids no matter where they are. And so we just started figuring out how to do it. And um, one of the uh, our first endeavors, um, well, I will say, I think what you referred, were, referred to initially was the story. We were in the Philippines and I happened to be in a vehicle by myself one night and uh, on a dark highway, a busy highway, bumper to bumper traffic. And I looked out the window and there's a group of very small children on the side of the road in the dark. And I asked the, the man who was had kindly offered me a ride to our hotel. And I said, um, why are they out there? And he said, well, that's where they live. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, why? And he said, you know, maybe they were born there or maybe they were abandoned because their parents simply couldn't take care of them. And by the time Rick got back to the hotel, I'm like, we have to do this now. We can't wait, we have to get this done. And so that's how it really started. So in 2019, we formally uh, founded the World Federation of Youth Clubs. So we just last year, 2023, the very first club of what is now the World Federation of Youth Clubs, Tijuana, Mexico, was started, followed soon thereafter by South Africa with some very special, the help of some very special friends of, of yours, the Bridges family. So tell the audience a little bit about kind of that story of, about Mexico and South Africa and, and the very beginnings of World Federation. Well, you know, it's Mexico is on the southern border of the U.S., and we know that there's a lot of need in Mexico in many different ways. And a wonderful group of people in Tijuana got together and they said, we want to replicate what they've got in the U.S. And early on, they teamed up with some wonderful leadership people in San Diego of the Boys and Girls Clubs there. And the power of that organization of between Tijuana and, and, and Greeley there in San Diego is what made it happen. The problem was uh, they needed to get the support of Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And I was chairman of the organization and it wasn't hard for me to get support there. Roxanne, our, mm -hmm. our uh, president at that time was fully behind it and Glenn and uh, and you put these three pieces together and that's boom, then it started. And what I, what they did so remarkably is they weren't just going to start a club. They believed they had a vision across Mexico. They started a national organization of the Club de Niños, Niños de Mexico. So that was a great uh and a genius move. Which will also be a great example to other countries who can do the same thing. Certainly it is. You, you, when you have the template, and while so many looked at Boys and Girls Clubs of America, was the model worked. It had been refined over a hundred years, and it worked. And there were, what we had to do, as Susan said, adapt it and adopt it to cultures out there. But now that in individual countries, you really want to create a model country organization to help seed different clubs throughout the country. I mean, our goal is for each club individually or as a, a unit, if it's within the same uh, you know, like a geographical area, to be able to be sustainable, to be able to support themselves. And one of the things we do is help them um, put together a great board that can hopefully lead to that sustainability and, and uh, help them have a long-term success. And we were able in Mexico, that was 15 years ago, uh, we were able um, to not only, you, you were far more deeply involved than I and, and actually the organization of that, but we felt so honored that we were able to help them financially also and um, give them initial funding uh, as part of that that initial group, and and um, I, I still think very very fondly about attending the opening of that very first club in in yes. Tijuana, and just just 
how happy everybody was and uh, that they had a lot of resistance uh, within that area to even start building the club. And, and now how many do we now have in Mexico? 15 years later, 14 clubs, clubs. across seven yeah. states in Mexico. As you said, an amazing model of how do you build a national organization, common set of child safety standards, common set of programs, rolling up the collective impact, exciting things happening in Mexico, South Africa, just on the heels of, of Mexico. And I bring that up because to your point, it's a place where we're we're working to establish that national organization model, because while we're proud of the clubs we have in the Johannesburg and Soweto area, certainly there's needs beyond that. And I right. know that you all have personal passion about that. But, but well, you know, sometimes you just let it happen uh, opportunistically. Mm -hmm. And that's where South Africa was was all about that. And you know what? I just love that uh, it was early days. Uh, Glenn really started, you know, getting it in my mind, too. He said, we want to develop, enhance, and advance clubs all over. South Africa, it meant looking for opportunities. You might come in. We, uh, we have very dear, dear friends, Wendy and Bo Bridges. Those of you in the United States will for sure know who Bo Bridges is. He's a um, world-renowned actor, uh, Grammy Award winner, by the way, <laughs> has many other awards too, but he's one of our board members and has always been extremely passionate about giving back. He and Wendy, their entire family, his brother Jeff is also really involved in, in child hunger and in other areas, and they really care about um, humanity and about people. And we were actually at Wendy and Bo's anniversary party, their 25th anniversary party, talking to Casey um, Bo's son, um, and um, Casey had been in South Africa with Bo while Bo was filming a Free Willy movie, and Casey was telling us that he was uh, had been helping a group of young kids who play soccer, but they don't have any shoes, they don't have any uniforms, they don't even have a ball. They were using tape put together as a ball. And so we were able to help him, you know, provide some of those things for those kids. And then Rick started talking to him about, we want to expand to South Africa. Are you interested in, in helping us out there? And um, this is bigger than soccer. Yeah. yeah. This could change the, the, the future for so many young people. The genesis of this. And so we saw these empty buildings in some of the, um, like in Soweto where we were, and they were owned by the government empty hadn't been used for years and so they gave us one the very first one and it was called the butt hut and so we said well we're going to change that name that's how we good did move it. yeah it was actually named after somebody <laughs> his last name was butt okay. yeah it was cute but anyway it, it was hugely successful and now we have nine clubs in south africa right. and expanding and we're looking now to expand a trip you were just on to south africa talking about the timing and how long those clubs have been there. So I did just take my first trip there. It's awesome. Unbelievable. Very moving. Nine clubs, two school-based sites as well. And the interesting thing was, if you think back to the timing of how long ago it would have been when the first kids went to those clubs, mm -hmm. I happened to be at one of the clubs on matriculation day, or as we would say in the United States, graduation day. Oh, okay. And so I met a few, not, not one, but a few young people who were matriculating successfully from our equivalent of high school. And these were young people who had joined the Boys and Girls Club when it first opened. And now 10, 12 years later for many of them, the story unfolds. So wow. it, was, it was really moving to meet some of those young people and, oh, and see the fruits of labor. We've found that certain clubs in the United States have gotten their board members and some of their kids that finance to go over there and work with that club and spend the time there and you know uh, you know i don't know if it's the right word that they, they're almost like a sister club to sure. them and you find because that's a wonderful thing about in the united states there's this attitude of uh, really let's try to help elsewhere in the world and it's that's the first place we saw it happening, and, but it's happening more and more, isn't it, Kirk? Absolutely, and, and obviously the demand has grown tremendously. You start we started Mexico and then South Africa, and then word got out mm -hmm. about this opportunity for youth clubs to to be advanced and developed and enhanced. And by 2018, 24 countries were being served before WFYC was created as an independent organization. 
I guess at that point, you two realize, hey, there's something bigger here. And, and, and maybe that was the impetus for becoming an independent organization. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, perspective, too, that um, that I think is important here. I mean, the United States, I mean, uh, we're a country, most, all of us are immigrants in the United States. That's what the founding of the country. But even as great a country as it is, it's still only 5% of the world's population. And what that means is there are or 95% of the world's population over there. And there's around 200 countries in the world often say, okay, we're in how many countries now? 45. 45 as yeah. of today. But do the math. That means there's- 160 100... countries yeah, that's to go. Still, people talk about what's your elevator speech, the essence of what really happens and what the formula. And I love it when you talk about the three Ps and comment on that because people have to be able to attract people to this. They have to have a uh, simple, consistent, replicatable kind of a uh, pitch right. on what we do. And I think adaptability is key right across countries and cultures. But Susan yeah. said earlier, kids are kids. Right. Well, there's some common traits that every young people's every young person is looking for that we are providing a place, a safe place where they can learn and grow free from physical, social, emotional harm. People, caring people, trained youth workers, trained youth volunteers who are willing and ready to pour themselves into these young people. And then meaningful programs, the programs that are going to develop the holistic child. And so I think those are the things we have to continue to drive forward. Uh, I would ask you as the co-founders, right, and the visionaries behind WFYC, we now have this amazing movement of clubs in 45 countries, 3,700 sites, almost a half a million young people being served thanks to our affiliates. As you look forward the next three years, what's your vision? What's next for WFYC and our affiliates? Where do we need to be focused? There's lots of wonderful things going on. One thing that is really important to me that I would like to see going forward, I think we're really good at connecting the um, club professionals, uh, through, especially through our international conference which was fabulous. This, this last one was incredible. You guys did such a, Abby and you and Tony nice and Dan, everybody did a great job. And um, I think going forward, I, I hope that we figure out a way to connect the teens and the kids and the clubs, because I want them to see how kids in other countries, especially with all the turmoil going on, and we have I think 90 something wars going on around the world. And we only hear about a few of them here in the United States, but I would love a way that the teens and the kids in the clubs can get to know the other kids around the world virtually. Maybe there's something we do at the conference. I'm not quite sure how to do that, but we have to do it in a safe, healthy way. Mm -hmm. The issues with, you know, online activities. Um, that's my, one of the things that's really important to me is I, I hope we can connect them because I think that's going to make a huge difference when they're adults, when their children are adults. And I think that will help us bring us all together. All of our affiliates uh, out there, deeper your engagement, figure out more how we can be repeater stations and you know, do what they did in, in Mexico. They went from Tijuana to how many clubs in Mexico? 14 clubs. And these are big Clubs, beautiful, clubs. Yeah. And, beautiful. and they're beautiful. And but they don't uh, have to be. You can that's have. True. Oh, it can be true. a small club that serves just a few children, but it will make a huge impact. And not only for them, but also the community. It makes the community safer. Um, I mean, if you give kids something positive to do instead of something the negative influences out there, I mean, it's going to. I mean, obviously, it hugely impacts the child, yes. but it makes a big impact on the community. You know, I was in Guatemala City. And uh, visiting a club they had opened there in a in a and it was a house, you know, four rooms downstairs, four rooms upstairs, almost, you know, didn't cost anything to open it, to furbish it. I, I walked into one room and there's young teenagers in there learning how to use an iPad. Well, most of them didn't own one, but they aspired to have that. They had some smartphones. But when I looked at this, I said, Wow, this is to your point. You don't have to, this is where many wealthy countries come in. They think they need to build a palace. This was a basic four rooms and four rooms 
And I asked them, how many kids are you taking care of? They said, 50 kids per here, six hours a day. Wow. You start to say, that's the way you start it. You start right. with a model that you can replicate it. S simple, consistent, scalable. That you know works. So what can you add to this? What do you see going forward? What are you working on that you would like to share? Yeah, so I think a big a big task for us as a team is is how do we deepen the engagement of our affiliates? Mm -hmm. So we've built this movement across 45 countries and we've brought them together to some degree. How do we continue to enhance that and let them support each other? I love what you said about the youth voice and and bringing the youth together because you know we're in this business of building global citizens. And the only way to do that is to listen to them, right? right. Listen to those young people. So I think a, a, a big opportunity for us going forward is how do we take what we've done with the adults, the youth yeah. workers, and how do we replicate that with the youth? And I think that's when you really begin to build this powerful movement. I think awareness is key. I think uh, greater accessibility to programs and learning opportunities through the website and member portal. I think all of those are going to be key. You know, in, in a nutshell, we cannot rest. Right. Right. I mean, we are unwavering in our commitment because the need is that urgent. A lot of nonprofits go through a very slow, organic growth cycle. We cannot do that. No. no. The needs are too great. I know I'm preaching to the choir big yeah. time. Um, so we're, we're ready to, mm -hmm. to expand our reach and deepen our impact. I also want to say uh, emotional wellness Absolutely. is very important to us and something that we are focused on. And it's it's obvious here in the United States, a great need, but all everywhere around the world, we're finding we, we know the same. We hear about that. All right, but now, past. yeah. Right. And, 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 and equipping our staff members, our youth workers with, with how to identify that and how to help with right. it, right? They're, they're the front line. They're the first responders. And in so many cases, they're they're not equipped well enough. Not no fault of their own, right? But I think that's a great role. And in have. many cities, there are organizations and individuals that you can reach out to. Um, but in a smaller community, often there's not a professional, but there's always somebody that can offer great advice or or help. And so just help them learn how to identify those helpers as needed. Agreed. Yeah. You know, I, I I think one of the greatest points of pride that we have right now is when an organization that has been around, uh, and it's our largest affiliate, the UK, uh, you know, they have joined WFYC uh, with a, you know, a vision to really becoming better, to becoming more affiliated, working together more effectively, because they've been pretty much as an organization going it alone, and you've been over there and visited with them, and boy, that, that makes me really proud because they're terrific people. It's a great point. It's a great organization. Some won't, won't realize the oldest, some of the oldest youth clubs in the world, dating back to the early 1800s. I've yeah. been there. Some of them are still in the same buildings, <laughs> which have been very well kept and are beautiful buildings. But they have this National Association of the Boys and Girls Clubs of the UK back mm -hmm. to this national model. And they've come to us for assistance in strengthening that network. And so we're actively involved, myself and actually some of our WFYC board members, actively involved in how do we strengthen their board? How do we enhance their staff? How do we uh, increase their access to the kind of programs that they need? And they are very committed to, to strengthening that network and, and leveraging their reach. And, and we're walking right there beside them. It's a great example. They're, they're a large organization, a lot of history. On the flip side of that, we're seeing a lot of our recent growth is happening across Africa and, you know, single site organizations typically started by a founder who's very mission minded and passionately driven and knows what they want to do, knows what their community needs, knows the programs that need to be offered, but they don't have the model or the best practices around how do you build a sustainable youth organization? And that's the magic of WFYC is we're able to come in and focus on those things we've been talking about during this, this episode. And so we're really seeing some tremendous impact among those, what I would call smaller, although very significant youth clubs across Africa, as an example. Also, um, we have a young lady who's now on our council, um, Achak Mejak. Yes. And Achak is a world-renowned model, gorgeous young lady. 
um, who has some great ideas. She's from South Sudan, her family is. And um, she's really interested. And, and that helps tremendously when you have people like Achak or you have, in, when you were in South Africa, you met with a group of people that we met through friends of ours. I mean, we were asking people, do you know anybody in Cape Town? Do you, you know, and that's how we make connections. And you get people, you find people who are passionate about helping kids. And, and you know, now that organization is going to expand. And so we're really looking forward to, I see great expansion in, in Africa and the continent. Great, so, tremendous yeah. need. But you know, this is just what we're doing here today. Uh, once you have the model, uh, then you just have to find other people who care like you do and want to get behind it. And it's uh, you mean model like the clubs, not yes. a right? Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. couldn't resist. But you know, it's not astrophysics. This is a model that's you know back to this simple, consistent, scalable, and that's why sports draws kids to our clubs, and we know that from that world famous South Africa original butt hut, that was soccer originally. In this country, it's usually basketball. That, but, you know, they found a way to bring the NBA to even to Soweto. And they, in this NBA, put up a uh, outdoor you know, court. Which reminds me, as you talk about sports, tell us what's going on with, with, between Minnesota and Liberia. Yeah, so uh, Sports and Leadership Academy, two incredible founders, Frankie and Gabe, uh, born in Liberia, immigrated to Minneapolis, to Minnesota, and have gone back and started the Sports and Leadership Academy. They actually operate in, in both Minnesota and Liberia and are having an incredible impact on young people. You know, last year in our Promise Awards, we recognized one of their young people who's a track star yeah. and came to the United States and, and actually earned an NCAA scholarship in track and field. Amazing. So, you know, you could go around the world and see the, the direct impact one, one child at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously the three of us could talk about this yeah. on and on. It's, a, it's an obvious passion. And Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony, Anthony Towns, yeah. speaking of Minnesota, yeah. uh, NBA All-Star from the Minnesota Timberwolves. A great season. Global Ambassador. Yes, that's right. We hope this season lasts well into the summer. Yeah. Uh, his parents were from the Dominican Republic, and he is committed to bringing WFYC youth clubs to the Dominican Republic. In fact, we just completed a due diligence trip there and think we found the right partner. So Wonderful. a lot of amazing partners and people who are getting behind this. Uh, I have to bring it back to where we started. Thanks to the passion of you two. I mean, there's nobody else doing, no other organization doing what the World Federation of Youth Clubs is doing if you get right down to it. And that wouldn't be happening if 15 years ago, the two of you hadn't made a commitment to that. We as a professional team certainly feel very honored to be a part of this journey with you. Uh, the support that you provide us, the guidance that you provide, it's incredible. The rest of our board, the rest of our council, uh, as they say, the best is yet to come. In my opinion. And you know what, Susan and I talk about it, one of the Biggest things we look forward to is being able to visit more of these clubs in the future. Yeah. And I certainly have appreciated the time here today. Well, the fact that we started at the beginning of a pandemic did not help. <laughs> so, so now we are able to travel and we look forward right. to doing that. So hopefully we'll see you all soon in person. Yeah, it's going to be a great journey yeah. ahead. Susan, Rick, thank you both so much. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you'll join us. For future episodes, I hope you will follow WFYC on social media, all of the channels, uh, and we couldn't do this without your support. We'll close with a with another shout out to our affiliates who, the, who are the ones on the front line making this happen every day for the young people in their communities. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and thank you, Kurt.